Back in intensive care, Noor's father, Abdullah, wants the world to see his child. Was she fighting, he asks. She was playing at home. Does she have weapons? Half of her brain is gone. Noor was born after her parents had 10 years of IVF. Her father says he's not in Hezbollah, but now wishes he was. You just heard from the father of one of 6,000 people injured in Lebanon by Israeli strikes. And I think that that video is the perfect illustration of how counterproductive Netanyahu's so-called strategy is, if you can even call it that. That man, as you just said, was not a militant. But seeing his daughter injured like that radicalized him. Anyone in his position would feel the exact same way. But that little girl was one of thousands of people injured or killed by the bombs dropped by Israel in Lebanon, Gaza, the West Bank, Syria, Yemen, and maybe Iran next. Who knows? But with regard to Lebanon, more than 100,000 people have been displaced, and the prime minister of Lebanon estimates that up to 1 million people in total could have actually been displaced by Israeli bombs, with some staying in refugee camps and others fleeing to Syria. And in the Friday attacks that killed Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah, the dozens of 2,000-pound bombs that Israel reportedly dropped on Beirut were uh, supplied by, you guessed it, the United States. And one Pentagon official told the Washington Post that he'd never seen so many bombs used against a single target. And I can't play the videos of the attack on YouTube, but you can find them on the internet if you really want to, but just know that it was utterly devastating. There are now innocent civilians in Beirut trapped under the rubble as we speak. Catastrophic. And more than 1,000 people have died in Lebanon within the past two weeks. But all of this death and destruction is apparently worth it to Netanyahu because they've managed to kill about 20 Hezbollah militants on Friday, including Nasrallah. So the price paid in innocent life is well worth the cost to somebody like Netanyahu who couldn't care less about them. And predictably, the usual suspects are repeating the same talking points here in the United States to justify these war crimes. For example, sociopathic Senator John Fetterman tweeted, Hezbollah is solely responsible for the conditions in Lebanon. Hamas owns the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. And I'm assuming that you can apply that same logic to any other country that Israel chooses to bomb. Israel can never do any wrong ever, according to our politicians, because there's no such thing as proportionality. And the laws of war don't apply to Israel because they're simply above the law, because they're defending themselves. So that gives them a blank check to do whatever the fuck they want. The problem is that it's really difficult for Israel to say that they're trying to defend themselves, considering this. As NBC News reports, Israel took the decision to assassinate Nasrallah after concluding he would not accept any diplomatic solution to end the fighting on the Israel-Lebanon border that was not tied to an end to the war in Gaza, an Israeli official said. Israel had tried repeatedly to reach a separate diplomatic solution with Hezbollah since October 8th, but Nasrallah was adamant he would continue firing until Israel made a deal with Hamas the official told NBC News. Now, this information comes from an Israeli official, and we should take anything that they say with a grain of salt since they continue to lie every single day. But even as they try to make themselves look good and make it seem as if they actually want a diplomatic solution, they just admitted that the rocket fire from Hezbollah would have stopped if Israel stopped doing the genocide in Gaza. But they care more about doing the genocide than their own security. And Netanyahu has made it abundantly clear that he has no intention of stopping the genocide. So that was out of the question when it came to negotiations with him and Hezbollah. And he's sabotaged peace talks. And now he's playing the victim in order to justify the slaughter that we're seeing in Lebanon, too. With the excuse being, well, you know, we have to defend ourselves because they're firing rockets at us. While not mentioning that the rockets are as a result of his genocide in Gaza. That escalation happened because of his escalation first and foremost. And the worst case scenario is now officially playing out right before our eyes, before U.S. election, mind you. Because today, Israel notified the United States that a ground invasion of Lebanon is now imminent. So our worst fears are materializing. Israel could plausibly turn Lebanon into another Gaza. And before Israel even gave us the heads up that they were preparing a ground offensive in Lebanon, 
it was obvious. And Israeli journalist Gideon Levy said that it would likely happen. And he also gave us some additional insight as to how he thinks this is going to play out and what the excuses will be based on Netanyahu's past tactics. First, it will be, as usual, presented as a very, very limited one, limited in time, limited in territory. We have been in those shows many times. And then it will get complicated, and then we'll have to widen it and and ex expand the, the time that we stay there. As usual, we are getting into those things without having any clone, any any idea how will we get out of it. Look at Israel in Gaza. Nobody has a clue how we are getting out of Gaza. We are not getting out of Gaza. Israel is going to repeat the same mistake with Lebanon using the, the, the excuse or the passiveness of the world, which allows Israel to do now whatever it wants. Netanyahu, I think, is also now in euphoria after the, what is perceived in Israel as wonderful successes, James Bond successes, first with the, with the pages and with the walkie-talkies and then with all the assassinations, this is perceived in Israel as an enormous success. So being riding on this success, I guess nothing will stop Israel to get into a ground operation. And then, you know, there will be a moment that a regional war might become a factor, might become a reality. And then what? When Iran might come in? So it's the same playbook from Gaza. And he referenced the euphoria that Netanyahu is now probably feeling after being supported and applauded by the U.S. government every step of the way, even after escalating tensions multiple times to the point where now they're at war with Lebanon outright. But I do want to come back to Levy's comments about Iran. Just put a pin in that because what he says there is really important because there is more to that story given what Netanyahu said today about Iran in particular. Now, I do want to back up a little bit because before Israel warned the United States that its ground invasion of Lebanon was imminent, Biden was asked about Netanyahu's escalation and he offered this word salad in response. Mr. President, has Netanyahu gone too far? Any comment on the strikes in Yemen, Mr. President? Cool. He supports uh, collective bargaining and thinks that they're going to settle the strike. I'm thinking he just misheard them. I hope he misheard them. But I think it's emblematic of a deeper problem here. Biden is just MIA. He's MIA mentally and he's MIA in terms of just being a fucking leader. Like, this is one of the reasons why Netanyahu feels so emboldened, because he is dealing with a U.S. president who's not just a committed ideological Zionist, but who's also in cognitive decline and easy to manipulate. But I mean, if Biden's incoherent babbling doesn't give you a sense of where he stands, well, I think that this headline from Reuters should. So this was published the day before Israel's Friday strikes, and uh, it says Israel announced it had secured $8.7 billion aid package from the United States. So, uh, you know, if Biden's own words doesn't make it clear where he stands, that should make it crystal clear. But to be fair to Biden, he did take a couple of more questions from the press. And um, I'm sure you're going to be so surprised that he's still feigning concern about a regional war after emboldening Netanyahu again and again and again. Are you going to talk to Prime Minister Netanyahu? you have anything to say to him? Yes, I will be talking to him. I'll tell you what I say to him when I talk to him. Can an all-out war in the Middle East be avoided? It has to be. We, uh, we really have to avoid it. We've already taken precautions relative to our embassies and personnel who want to leave. And uh, But uh, we're not there yet, but we're working like hell with the French and many others. I mean, it's just embarrassing at this point. What else can you say? Even Republicans like George H.W. Bush and even Ronald Reagan cut weapons to Israel or at least threatened to do so when they disobeyed America. Yet, Biden refuses to even make that threat. In fact, his own Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, literally lied at the behest of Israel in order to keep supplying them with weapons in defiance of U.S. law, which then prompted calls for him to resign, which I'm sure won't be heeded. But I mean, this right here is going to be Biden's legacy. 
He's not going to be remembered as the guy who saved democracy by stepping aside to let Kamala Harris take his place. He will be remembered as the Democratic Party's equivalent of George W. Bush, as the president who continued to lie to the American people to kill Arabs. That is going to be his legacy. Although in this day and age, you know, him being the Democratic Party's George W. Bush might be taken as a compliment given how the party has openly embraced war criminals like Dick Cheney. But to be clear, it's not just Biden. It is the entire administration here that is doing this bullshit. Blinken, Sullivan, and also Matt Miller, who uh, spoke out of both sides of his mouth when he was asked by Netanyahu flagrantly dismissing calls for restraint. We have seen a very sharp escalation by the Israelis. So is your, your call for restraint has failed. So we continue to call for a diplomatic resolution, but at the same time, as I said, Hezbollah has continued to launch rockets that have kept Israeli civilians from returning to their home. And Israel absolutely, along with any, along with every country in the world, has a right to defend itself from terrorism. It also has a right to go after legitimate terrorist targets like Hassan Nasrallah, and we support them taking those steps. Um, just as we have brought terrorists who targeted American citizens to justice over time. But that said, we long term want to see a diplomatic resolution. That's what we're continuing to pursue. But it's just all those things were true. You know, we've seen this, the Hezbollah rocket fire for many, many months. What we've had in the last week or two is the killing of more than a thousand people, according to Lebanese officials, mm -hmm. in these Israeli strikes. More than a million people displaced, according to the United Nations. I mean, that's a huge game changing escalation and last week you were calling for restraint so i'm just sort of asking the question about whether or not you think you got restraint well or your calls were heeded let me just take a few things specifically when it comes to the death of hassan nasrallah which is i think the the event that most people have have referred to as the most escalatory we support bringing him to justice look even though we say we want restraint we support this escalation because nasrallah was a bad guy okay except what happens if you take that logic and you apply it to any other country well, you quickly begin to realize how dangerous that thinking is because it opens the door to the United States being drawn into war with any other country of Israel's choosing. So if Israel chooses to, say, escalate tensions with Iran to the point where Netanyahu chooses to take out the Ayatollah, for example, what then? Are you going to let Israel goad you into a major war in the Middle East under the pretense of, oh, we're just taking out the bad guys? Is that really what you're willing to let them do? Unfortunately, I think the answer is yes, but we may soon find out because uh, before Israel told us about their ground invasion of Lebanon, well, Netanyahu released this ominous video to the people of Iran in English, which is an odd choice, and his comments give us some insight into what he might be planning to do next. I want to address you, the people of Iran. Every day, you see a regime that subjugates you make fiery speeches about defending Lebanon, defending Gaza. Yet every day, that regime plunges our region deeper into darkness and deeper into war. Every day, their puppets are eliminated. Ask Muhammad Def, ask Nasrallah. There is nowhere in the Middle East Israel cannot reach. There is nowhere we will not go to protect our people and protect our country. With every passing moment, the regime is bringing you, the noble Persian people, closer to the abyss. When Iran is finally free, and that moment will come a lot sooner than people think, everything will be different. Our two ancient peoples, the Jewish people and the Persian people, will finally be at peace. Make no mistake about it, that right there was an implicit threat. Netanyahu has wanted war with Iran for a very long time, but he knows that he can't go to war with Iran unless he has the full backing of the United States. And now is as good of a time as ever to make that dream a reality because he has a Democratic administration and Joe Biden who's giving him the weapons to do whatever the hell he wants. And if Trump wins, well, it's even better yet because Trump just said this about Iran at a recent campaign rally. But if I were the president, I would inform the threatening country, in this case Iran, that if you do anything to harm this person, we are going to blow your largest cities and the country itself to smithereens. We're going to blow it to smithereens. You can't do that. And there would be no more threats. 
Now, to be clear, Trump wasn't talking about Iran within the context of Israel. He was reacting to news from intelligence agencies that Iran was reportedly plotting to assassinate him, presumably in retaliation for him assassinating Qasem Soleimani as president. Now, I'm not inclined to believe anything our intelligence community says after they lied about Iraq having weapons of mass destruction. But regardless if that's true or not, a President Trump who believes Iran is a threat to him individually is a president that would be very useful to Netanyahu. And Netanyahu has made it very clear that he wants Donald Trump to win. So this right here is a gift to Trump because Netanyahu knows this war isn't going to be popular with the Democratic Party's base that will hurt Biden and in turn hurt Kamala Harris. So needless to say, uh, Netanyahu launching an all-out regional war a month before the U.S. election feels like really conspicuous timing to me. But apparently Biden is uh, too oblivious to put two and two together and realize that Netanyahu is doing this because it benefits him and his buddy Donald Trump. But regardless of how much Israel is trying to go to Iran, into a regional war and a war with them and a direct confrontation with the U.S., the fact remains that it doesn't behoove Iran to get into a war with Israel, which is why they haven't taken the bait. They've already faced internal strife, growing dissatisfaction with their own population, and they just don't want a war. But Netanyahu is trying his best to get them to take the bait because this would be really great for him if they engaged in a war. Trita Parsi is going to explain more. Do you feel that the Israeli prime minister is attempting to pull Iran uh, into a war with the United States as the number one sponsor, the United States, of the military in Israel? I don't think there is any doubt that that is Netanyahu's game plan. And the reason why he has been successful in the last couple of weeks is not because of any particular action by the Israelis, although, of course, they've scored some major successes. It's because of the posture of the Biden administration. Biden has chosen to be so deferential, more deferential than any other American president has been to Netanyahu. And as a result, despite all of the talk of wanting to avoid a larger regional war, which clearly is in the U.S. interest to avoid, Biden has adopted a posture in which he essentially says that that's what he wants to avoid, but then he provides the Israelis with the weapons, the political protection, the diplomatic support, and the arms and money to be able to pursue exactly the escalation that Biden says that he does not want. That's the big difference that has happened here now, that the United States has now, under Biden, chosen to completely be um, uh, uh, in support of whatever Netanyahu wants to do. And that's the key right there. Netanyahu is in a situation where it benefits him to extend and broaden the conflict as much as he possibly can, because the second it's over, he may face corruption charges in Israel. So his career might literally hinge on him keeping the genocide and numerous wars going as long as possible. That is a dangerous person to have in power. And the situation really couldn't be better for Netanyahu when it comes to the United States. This is the opportune time for him because he has a U.S. president who supports him unconditionally. Kamala Harris has vowed to support Israel unconditionally, and she even cheered on his assassination of Nasrallah. But Netanyahu knows that things could get even better for him if Trump came to power again, because that would mean that Trump would actually follow him into war with Iran or let him go even further in Gaza without, you know, the hair wringing or even shit like that. So, you know, Netanyahu is seizing on this opportunity now that the time couldn't be better to ramp up escalations because he's trying to save his own ass. And him helping Trump get elected furthers that goal even more. But it's astounding that the Biden administration and Kamala Harris can't see that this is the move from Netanyahu. And by emboldening Netanyahu, both Biden and Harris don't realize that they are indirectly emboldening Donald Trump. But this could all end immediately like that if Biden did the most obvious thing ever, as explained by Israeli journalist Gideon Levy. The U.S. is saying one thing and acting exactly to the opposite direction. Can you believe that a major superpower is telling Israel to stop the war and in the same time it is supplying it with weapons and bombs and ammunition? What is Israel supposed to do? Why not to shoot and to bomb to continue to do this if the Americans are supplying it in an unconditioned way? No conditions. So this, uh, this hypocrisy must come to its end. The United States is supporting the war, is supporting Israel, 
the bombs that were falling on the bunker of Nasrallah were American bombs. The bombs that fall on Gaza are American bombs. The children who were killed, 17,000 of them in Gaza, were killed by American ammunition. And America, the United States, cannot say that it is against killing children because it is a partner. It's that simple. All this talk of restraint and how the Biden-Harris administration are working tirelessly for a ceasefire, it's not just insulting to us, it's humiliating for them because they don't just look like liars, they look like useful idiots for Netanyahu and Donald Trump by extension. I don't know what to say. They're getting humiliated on the world stage by somebody who wants Trump to get elected while thinking that they're going to be able to make us believe, I guess, that they actually want to end this when they're not doing the one thing that would facilitate an end to this. I don't even know what to say at this point. Like, what else can you say? It's the same shit. Cut off the weapons and this ends. He won't do it, so it's not going to end. So why even say anything at this point? Just, like, shrug. Don't say shit because we already know what you're going to say. In fact, uh, Biden said the same thing when he was asked about the uh, ground invasion being imminent in, in Lebanon. Uh, he said, he's actually said that there should be a ceasefire. I kid you not. Israel may be now launching a limited operation into Lebanon. Are you aware of that? Are you comfortable with their plans? I'm Mr. more aware than you might know, and I'm comfortable with them stopping. We should have a ceasefire now. Thank you. you. <laughs> I mean, what do you even say at this point? I have to laugh to keep from crying because this feels like a parody. Biden is like a broken fucking record. And because he's so feckless, because he's such a failed leader, we're now in this situation where Israel is attacking multiple countries with the weapons and bombs that we gave them. They're destroying entire cities in the West Bank. They're doing a genocide in Gaza that hasn't stopped either, by the way. And 40,000 U.S. troops have been deployed to the Middle East to be ready to defend Israel in the event Netanyahu chooses to escalate with more countries or escalate even further. And the best we can get from Biden is, guys, you have to stop seriously. That's effectively what he's saying, while continuing to give them more bombs, by the way. I don't even know what to say. You can't make this shit up. It's a fucking joke, but this is the reality. Biden's leadership, leadership I say in quotes, has got us to this point. This would have ended if Biden ended the supply of weapons and bombs to Israel, but since he chose to not do the right thing and the logical thing, this is where it's at, where it's blowing up in his face and Kamala Harris's face a month before the election. If only there weren't numerous warnings, if only people like me were listened to when we said cut off the fucking weapons, but I'm one of like a million people saying do the logical thing, but he won't. So here we are.